Okay, so now moving uh, swiftly on, uh, we now introduce uh, Sir John Byrne, who's Professor of Clinical Genetics at uh, Newcastle, and uh, not only involved as a clinical geneticist, uh, but also some of you will know him for his development of uh, quantum medics and its uh, amazing kit. Sir John. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, sir. An honour to uh, speak after this stellar uh, cast, uh, and I, give, I, I thought I'd choose a slightly challenging title, so at least you'd stick around and not go for an early coffee. Uh, but this is not a negative talk, it is however a realistic talk. Um, but it, just to, to follow the Minister's um, analogy with space, it's worth remembering that this is one of three massive revolutions that have transformed my life and your lives in, in recent years. Not only do we have genomics hitting us, but we've also got uh, those geostationary satellites that allow us to talk to each other constantly with our mobile phones. And through those mobile phones have access to all the world's knowledge in every library in a, on the planet. I mean, imagining that when I was a medical student would have been very challenging. Like Sally, I, I've been in this game for four and a half decades. And in fact, I thought I'd start with this certificate because it was given to me by Victor McCusey, who I went to work for as a medical student in the Old World Clinic in Baltimore. We went to the Jackson Lab uh, to do our summer school, and I got my certificate of, uh, on in medical genetics from Victor. Um, uh, that's what I looked like. I don't think I knew I was having my picture taken there, and I'm quite certain my wife wished I hadn't taken that one. Uh, don't tell her I assured you it. Uh, we actually had nothing to live on, so we ate uh, lobsters, clams, and stole sticky buns from the conference because uh, we had no money. But in the background there is Victor McCusick, who later had me join his editorial board on OMIM, the online medical uh, textbook. Uh, he's the one on your right with the bad dress sense. Uh, so Victor uh, was probably the world's greatest clinical geneticist and only died recently, uh, and he uh, inspired me to, to do this. But the reason I put the picture up is he also chose the term genomics for a new journal. And that's what really kicked off the turn. So really, I kind of, I'm, I'm from the pre-genomic era, uh, which makes me very old indeed. Uh, in fact, I chose to get into genetics like Sally. In fact, the double helix inspired me. But what really inspired me was at the age of 17, being taken by our biology teacher to hear a lecture on the genetic code. The people tend to think about the double helix, forget the genetic code is an equally brilliant breakthrough, mostly by British scientists, working out how you take four letters, in this case, the four letters of RNA, uh, and explain all of human life. And it was uh, apparent that in order to account for all the amino acids and the bit of grammar, you needed to look at them in sets of three in order to have enough combinations to cover all the bases. So, for example, you take the letters G, U, and C, and you get a Bailey. But the fact is, because you only got a couple of dozen uh, requirements, you've got 64 combinations, it's a degenerate code. So, in fact, you could take G, U, and anything, and you still get a Bailey. And therein lies one of the problems we have when we start whole genome sequencing. You can change millions of letters and make no difference whatsoever. Conversely, change the U to a C and you switch a valine to an alanine, and that can be massively disruptive to the function of a protein. So working out which letter matters and which doesn't as we move into this huge new uh, data world is going to be a major challenge for us. And as you've already heard, informatics, I don't need to tell this audience, is where we really need to make major progress. So as a clinical geneticist, this is the sort of family that I've been dealing with all my life. I've been a consultant now since 1984, which makes me feel very old. Um, and this is Lauren Trudy. I saw uh, Trudy when she was a little girl, a diagnosed as having Noonan syndrome, and then had to think with her whether she wanted to take the chance of having a child uh, or not, because it was a 50-50 chance. Uh, she decided to go for it. Lauren, in fact, inherited the gene and had a very major heart defect, which we managed to successfully correct. Uh, the problem was I couldn't find the cause. We spent years sending DNA from this family all over the world, and we didn't know which gene caused it. But we could still make a big difference to their clinical care. Not only do we diagnose and give prognosis therapy, but we can also discuss why it happened, will it happen again, will it be as bad, and are there any tests? And of course, now we have the tests. In fact, we found it was a gene called BRAF, uh, that was mutated in this family with the help of a Dutch and Japanese teams. And it took us 10 years. Uh, about five, about 10 years ago, I was at a conference in Manchester 
and we were discussing whether we could decide which of the increasing number of genes that we should test for Noonan syndrome, and I said, why not just shoot them all? Uh, and uh, so we actually set up an assay with St George's. We have a spin-out company called New Gene, owned by our hospital. Uh, and now for £970, you can test all the genes that cause Newton syndrome in a single shot. And BRAP is there on the right-hand side there. So that was a big step forward. It meant that instead of waiting 10 years and begging researchers to do it, we could order a test and get the answer. And then, of course, that opens up possibility of things like pre-implantation diagnosis uh, in order to avoid having a child affected by these uh, quite serious diseases. We've got on from there to exome capture. So this is some work from my partner, uh, Patrick Chinnery, and he's a world expert on uh, mitochondrial diseases. And this is a paper he published where he showed that these, some of those vanishingly rare syndromes you've just seen described, if we pull out the sort of 1.5% of the genome that is the coding segments of genes, as, as John McGrath, the dermatologist in London, said earlier this week, uh, at the conference we were speaking at, he said it's a bit like watching match of the day instead of watching all the football games in the country. Uh, and so you just see all the goals. Uh, and so you can basically pull out that, that small percentage of the genome. And this is a very attractive proposition in clinical practice because you go to the, the, the key genes uh, and look for spelling changes that we can, we can understand the meaning of. And we get about two-thirds of the cases explained by that approach. And the DDD project in Cambridge, which uh, I had the pleasure to sit on the advisory team for, has had major success in using whole exome sequencing uh, to look at families to, to find diagnoses. So why do we go to whole genome? Because whole genome's actually got more information for us. But before we do, just to think about the challenge, this is Patrick Chinnery, who took over from me as head of the Institute in Newcastle. And we were hosting at our science centre the Wellcome Trust display on genomics and this is what your genome would look like if you printed it out. That big book in the middle there is uh, would, would be what my X chromosome looked like. If you actually zoom in on it, in fact if you look very very close you have to have very good eyesight to read the letters in order to be able to print uh, the whole X chromosome in that book and that's I think page 835 of 1163 pages for your X chromosome. So. That's the sort of quantity of data we're dealing with. Uh, uh, I, I show you this because I, I sit on the board of NHS England now, and I'm proud to say we are the world's biggest purchaser of fax machines. Uh, now, imagine what would happen if we decided to fax this data to each other. You'd probably spend the whole of your life doing that job. So we've got to actually deal with a switch from this paper-based fax machine world into the digital world that, that Sir John uh, described before me. Uh, we've got to get the informatics of the NHS working if we're going to have any success. I'm proud to say that uh, among the 1.3 million people the NHS employs, I imagine that tens of thousands of them this morning have already written the letters DNA on someone's medical record. <laughs> Sadly, they use it to mean did not attend. Uh, and in fact, when you actually say to the colleagues, you know, what does DNA stand for? They go, uh, you know. In fact, we haven't got there yet. We've got a major educational challenge. Uh, and one of the things that we're doing with the, Geno with the Genomics England uh, and with the response to that is we've now set up master's courses in six centres, including our own. In fact, yes, just yesterday I gave the, the opening lecture to our second course. where we're bringing in clinicians from every branch of medicine to teach them the basics of genetics so that they can actually at least understand the reports that we're going to be sending out to them in the near future. So we shouldn't be, uh, uh, we've, we've heard three enthusiastic uh, supportive statements, but could genomics fall because it doesn't do what it says on the tin? And there is an, el an element of this. We've got to bear in mind that when we do a whole genome sequence, we've got error rates to deal with, with the technology. We've got inadequate depth of coverage. So if you're using the Illumina technique, it's a bit like a modern painting. It's lots of little dots. And it's possible to miss segments unless you have at least 30-fold coverage. There's huge segments of the genome which are replicated. And currently, whole genome sequencing picks up about 85% of those. But that's a big miss if the other 15% was actually the cause of the disease. And then you've already heard Viv mention the issue of uh, epigenetics, imprinting chemical changes in your DNA, which will actually profoundly change the way it works uh, and is, is partly influenced by our lifestyle. We don't pick that up yet. So in, in truth, when we do a whole genome sequence, we actually spell it wrong. Uh, there is actually uh, still holes in this process. 
Uh, and so we shouldn't just assume if you've had your whole genome sequence, there you are, we know everything. So this technological challenge is still real. We've got, uh, so far, half a dozen techniques. Uh, Sanger sequencing, the one we did for the whole Human Genome Project, uh, is great, but it's really slow and laborious. But that reads one letter at a time. All these other techniques are, are, are different approaches, and at the moment, none of them give exactly the same answer. And so we've got to try and get squeeze that technological variation out of the system. Illumina are clearly the team leaders at the moment, uh, and that's why Genomics England opted to go with them in terms of the genome project. But new technologies are coming along, and I'll mention more in a minute. But the point is that what we're finding from all these techniques is that we've each one of us got about three million variants that we've got to sift through to work out what works and what doesn't. You've already heard about the Human Genome Strategy Group uh, report that led to Genomics England, uh, which we've heard about from, from John. Uh, it's worth remembering that this was published at a time of considerable austerity. In fact, that's why we only got a half a photograph for the front. Uh, and so, I mean, basically, we've got to put this into the NHS at a time when our finances are under intense pressure. So we've got to work out how to do this realistically. Uh, we can't simply just pick it up and run with it because we are, uh, as you know, trying to actually cut costs. And while it's true that genomics will cut costs long term, hospitals trying to balance their budgets will need help to get this into play. Uh, this is uh, an example of why we don't just stick with exomes. These are three young people who, uh, two brothers from Garlic and a, girl, a little girl, Sean, from my hometown of Bishop Auckland, who I met back in the early 90s. And I, I uh, with my colleagues, we, we described them as having a new syndrome. One of the features that struck, struck us about them was that they had blockage of their noses, the coenal atresia, it's called. They couldn't breathe through their nose. And they had a very particular pattern of eye, ear, and face malformations, but normal intellect. Uh, and uh, I spent years trying to work out what this was. We wrote a paper about it back in the early 90s. Uh, a family was found in Alaska that did exome sequencing. They couldn't find the cause. But then uh, Bill Newman in Manchester said he found a family, said, let's have another go. We teamed up with German colleagues to do this. And this was the paper that came out. It's the only time I've been an author on a paper where I was also uh, in the title as well, because it's now called Bill McEwen syndrome. But the reason I put this up is that this was an international collaboration that pulled together these cases and do whole genome sequencing. And what we found was the reason that these children uh, had their problem was that they had lost one copy of a gene on chromosome 18, and they had a deletion in the promoter of the other copy. They were so-called compound heterozygotes. And that promoter deletion knocked the gene down. It didn't stop it working, it just slowed it down. The fact is, this is a gene that's critical to splicing. It's what assembles your genes uh, when, you're, when the fragments are copied up the DNA. If you completely lost that gene, it would kill you because you couldn't assemble any gene. But if you've lost one copy and you've got one copy not working very well, you can kind of just about manage to splice your genes together, but it causes malformations. So in other words, as we start to understand more about how genes work, we're going to need a new whole genome sequencing in order to pick up this subtlety because it's the promoters and the non-coding RNAs between the coding segments that are the fingers on the strings of the instruments. They're the bits of the, of the genome that will regulate gene function and many of the diseases that we are struggling with are actually not because of the coding segments but because of the bits in between the coding segments that make them work. So I'd like to go back to that original example I gave you of the whole gene of, of, of the genetic code. These are two sisters who I saw recently, Christine and Kathleen, who gave me permission to use their picture. Uh, and Kathleen had breast cancer. They had a strong family history of breast cancer. And my colleague genetically tested them, found that she had a mutation in BRCA1, and went on to test her sister as well, who also had that mutation. But our colleagues in the lab said, this is a very uncertain significance or if one of my uh, uh, nationals here to speak tomorrow says it, a, a very unhelpful statement. Uh, because a VUS is, is constantly being published. I mean, there are tens of thousands of variants of uncertain significance in BRCA1 and BRCA2. Uh, and so our counselor said, what should I say to this family? And I looked at a, a quick look on, on Google on my phone in the corridor, and it turns out that there was a paper published in 2007 by Doug Easton, one of the world leaders, where this mutation was seen alongside another mutation in BRCA1 in a patient in America. Now, you're not supposed to be able to survive losing both copies from birth. 
So they assumed this one was not pathogenic. However, when Susan Domchek went and found that patient, it turned out that lady had microcephaly, short stature, extreme drug toxicity. She was the one survivor of having two faulty copies of the gene. This is a pathogenic variant, and in fact, when you look at it across all species, that valine is present in every species on the planet that has a BRCA1, and all of them have BRCA1 because it's a DNA repair gene. Now, for it to be conserved so consistently, it's clear evidence it's an important amino acid. Changing that valine to an alanine is disruptive. So we can now tell that family, and indeed I did tell that family, that in fact this is pathogenic, and on the strength of that, Christine also had bilateral mastectomies uh, to avoid getting breast cancer. We give 10 million prescriptions a year of warfarin, and about 5% of us are sensitive, but we don't test people. We need to test tumours in order to decide what to do with them today. We need to test people for infectious diseases like malaria. Uh, so uh, I'm going to skip this slide, because, but just to say that we, we don't genotype for warfarin, even though we've shown by a randomised controlled trial that that would avoid dangerous bleeds and get people up to the right dose more quickly. But also, infectious diseases need genotyping fast. TB, in 2005, the red places were the world's uh, TB resistance. This is the drug resistant TB now across the planet. And Britain has more TB than the United States. We've got a major problem with this. We need devices that will give us a diagnostic tool. So about 10 years ago, my partner, Jonathan Maharan, was sitting next to Charlie Lieber in Harvard, and Charlie invented the nanowire. And Jonathan realized we could actually stick DNA on nanowires, and we, when they met their matching partner, the wire would detect it. And so we decided to build a device. Uh, and uh, the, the minister very kindly posed uh, when we went to the signing of the 100,000 Genomes uh, contract uh, with our device. And this is the little cassette but we've re-engineered the whole process. We can extract DNA in two minutes, we can do PCR in nine minutes, and then you bind it, your PCR products onto a chip uh, the size of your thumbnail, which will give you an answer, the whole thing inside 20 minutes. And I can today, since the minister is presenting his breakthrough, uh, show you the QPOC, uh, and we are hopefully gonna have this on the street this year. We're working with international partners now. And basically, you'll take a sample, whether it's a spat, spit sample, for example, for TV or a warfarin test, pop it in, have a cup of coffee, press the button to go, uh, and it will do the test for you and give you a result in 20 minutes. So I'm hoping uh, to see that actually on the street. There's a, the, the DNA test uh, for one of the warfarin markers. That's the non complementary DNA, that's the blanks. Very clean results. Uh, and so the device is now virtually ready to fly. And what we're hoping to do is see these in the pocket of clinicians around the world. This is not instead of whole genome sequencing, it's taking the knowledge gained from whole genome sequencing out into clinical practice so that people see genomics as part of their routine uh, practice. So in summary, and thanks to the 50 members of our company now, um, in summary, DNA analysis is going to cut across all medical disciplines, you've all got that point. We can use panels, we can use exomes, and we can use genomes. They all can work together, uh, although increasingly we'll move towards whole genomes and then use them for virtual exomes, etc. We must upgrade our informatics. This is going, to, is going to be what stops us in the NHS in particular. But I think point of care genetic testing will have a place because it's fast, it's cheap, uh, and it, you can throw it away. You can do the test you need an answer to and then discard it. So I think that uh, the answer to, to my title at the beginning was that this is going to be the rise and fall of genomics. Not because genomics will fail, but because it will be so successful that in the very near future, genomic medicine will just equal medicine. Thank you for your attention. Excellent stuff. Uh, always inspiring to hear you. Uh, questions from you. Hands up the questions. Well, actually, I've got a question for you while I, people are thinking about it. Because the Centre for Life has been uh, very, very successful. You mentioned 40,000 children a, a year going through it. I mean, I think this is going to be one of the recurring themes of uh, this event, that we need to get out there and to tell people about genomics. Not only because we want them to understand what we're doing, but also to uh, increase people's confidence 
And of course, for our own purposes, we like lots more informaticians. What's your experience when you're out there with the kids and how they react to all of this? I, I mean, the kids love it. I mean, just, just as Sally and I were inspired by double helices and things, I, you know, the kids are, are they get this. Uh, and, and so I, I give lots of, I gave a festive lecture to a couple of hundred year tens, uh, and they were, they were absolutely enthralled by it. I mean, I, you know, I think we really, uh, we can win them over. Uh, but I think that uh, the, the biggest challenge, actually, in a way, is not the kids. It's the staff that we already have. The people who sort of say, I can't do that. You know, it's like, I don't do maths, you know? Like, so you have people say, I can't do maths. You say, what's two and two? I'm sorry, I don't do maths. So you get the same reaction from a lot of clinicians. Genetics, that's something that is clever. Uh, just send it to the geneticists. So we've got to get everybody. That's why I think our point of care device can have a big impact on people's psychology. Uh, and that's why, and, I, and, and Bib, in fact, was one of our early supporters. And many people have been saying to Bib, she made a bit little film, if you haven't seen it, you must watch it, it was on YouTube, about genomics and medicine. And she showed how device did it. And people have been saying, don't be stupid, you can't do genetic testing on the spot. And she says, you can, I've seen it. And it's true, you can. Uh, so we've got to kind of demystify this. And I think, uh, and in fact, we've now been granted patents for sequencing on this technology. So in fact, I, I think as John said, we're going to get sequencing uh, down to you know, a very low price I mean, uh, in the very near future. It will just become part of routine care. Hi, uh, good morning. I'm Michelle Krishnan, a clinical research fellow at the Institute of Health in London. Hi. Um, so, uh, just thinking about diseases in terms of gene sets and pathways um, as a, that work together. And uh, so, for example, I work uh, researching newborn babies and thinking about this point of care testing is obviously very, very relevant in that context. Um, and I just wondered how many variants would you be able to, to put on your device yeah, if you wanted to do that? That's a very testing? good question. So, um, in the initial stages, we're actually, because nanowires, uh, to use them in good effect, standardizing them is still delicate. Uh, so we're going to use a fluorescent uh, detector in the very first devices because and we'll just be using three or four tests because for many situations like warfarin you only need three snips. But actually uh, the, the attraction of nanowires is we can get about 1500 features on a, a square centimeter chip. So in fact for, for, for example all the common variants of cystic fibrosis for example could go on. Uh, but even, even now, one of the things I'm hoping to do soon is the, there's a, a, a mitochondrial mutation you're probably aware of for, for gentamicin sensitivity. About 1 in 500 babies is sensitive to gentamicin. One dose will make them stone deaf. And yet we don't test for it because it's too much hassle. So when babies get infections, they get given gentamicin and then we just shrug and say, oh really sorry, your baby's gone deaf. So you know, I think we need that test out there. Uh, and there are lots of examples like that where we could even just with a single SID actually start making an impact on clinical management. But yeah, I agree. And we need to get this into primary care, into neonatal care, because that's where you need instant answers. A um, quick question from you, and I have to know who this is. This is Angela Douglas, uh, clinical lead at uh, the Northwest Coast Genomic Medicine Centre. Thank you, Ben. John, how, how long do you think it will be, I mean, we've already started to mainstream genetics and genomics to some of our um, clinical champions out there in medical practice. How long do you think it will be before our GPs start to recognise those patients when they hit the in primary care and start to um, get them tested at that stage so that we're diagnosing these patients earlier? I mean, it would be fantastic if these patients could then turn up at secondary care with their test already done. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I think that to some extent the GPs are quite reasonably trying to defend us against deluge because you know, our resources are limited and we're not training enough counsellors, we're not training enough people in genetics to, to help pick up that, that referral. Uh, I think I, I, I'm an optimist in life, always have been. I think that once you start getting some real payback, then the GPs will latch up to this very quickly. Uh, and, I, and I think that's why these sorts of you know, simple tests are what they need, the, the yes, no question, the answers to questions. Because GPs are, are, though, uh, incredibly well placed for something like familial hypercholesteremia. Absolutely. I mean, not only do they, are they the ones who are seeing very high cholesterol levels when people pitch up, but they also probably know the families. And actually for them to do the extended family testing is, is really exactly where it should be done. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, they should go back to being family practitioners from being general practitioners and actually looking 
after the extent of family. And I think this will be one of the vehicles for them doing that. So the answer is, it's got to be tough. And, 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 and I have to say, as a board member of NHS England, you know, we, we can't just catch this ball without help. It will take us a few years to actually build up the speed to absorb this impact. But there, there is huge enthusiasm for this. And I think once people see payback, traditions very rapidly learn the tricks. Uh, at the moment, they can't see the benefits, but they soon will. And of course, we mustn't forget about patient pull as well, because actually the yeah. demand for this type of testing, I and mean, if you talk to people who have that awful INR testing and they have to trudge up to hospitals and it takes them forever, and actually for them to be able to do Well, yeah, it. I mean, we, we, we sometimes take up to eight weeks to get people up the right warfarin dose. You could do a blood test and put them straight on the right warfarin dose. Imagine you bought your shoes that way. We'll give you a pair of size six. Let's come back next week. If this sore, we'll try a seven. Uh, and then next week we'll try an eight. You I, know, I mean, it's just ridiculous. I thought that was the actually the business model of ASOS, but anyway, never mind. <laughs> um, so, uh, thank you very much indeed, Sir John.